to Cooper Talk. Welcome to Cooper Talk. I'm your host, Steve Cooper. And remember, I'm only as hip as my guest. And i got to tell you something, people. My guest today, you know, I actually saw him. We know him from the band Blondie, but he's done so much more. And I saw him perform at, in Anaheim when I lived in L.A. like 10 or 12 years ago. And then I saw him this summer before last, when we could go to concerts. I saw him in Camden because I live in New Jersey now. I saw him at the BB&T. And he's, he's an amazing guy. And he uh, has a lot of... Uh, Interesting stories, I'm sure. My guest is Clem Burke. How you doing, Clem? I'm good, Steve. How are you today? Good. Now, you were saying, we we're just before we got to, you were talking about the BBC. Why do you listen to the BBC News so much? Well, you know, the news in the States, you know, it's all about sound bites and the commercials and doesn't really give you any kind of in-depth reporting. Uh, for instance, you know, during the whole time the pandemic was going on, they would have, like, for instance, you know, Fauci on and go in depth with him about what was going on and spend, you know, five or ten minutes interviewing him along with uh, many other, uh, you know, experts on uh, various topics, whether it be Black Lives Matter or, of course, the whole time Trump was in presidency, they would really uh, get more in depth about what was going on with all of that as well. And it's an interesting perspective you know, overview, I think it's not as uh, subjective. You know, they have a real objectivity, and they really try to do show both sides of an issue. And it's just more intelligent uh, reporting in general. And there's no commercials. You know, you watch the, the news in the U.S. every five minutes, there's a commercial, and most of it has to do with uh, one uh illness or another and kind of the kind of projecting that on the general public and obviously you know the bbc is owned by the government and it's not commercial and the same thing listening to public radio you know it avoids all the kind of uh manipulative media that exists in uh commercial uh media in general i think so and you know being with blondie and my various other bands i have a lot of friends and a lot of business uh, in the UK in particular. And, you know, they report all throughout Europe. And the whole Brexit issue that was going on, it was interesting to see their observations on that. Just uh, It's just a more intelligent way of broadcasting the news to the general public, I think. And uh, it was a saving grace during the pandemic because, you know, you could have a world overview while sitting on your couch in lockdown. How have you dealt with lockdown? You're a guy who performs. I always talk to musicians. I always try to explain to people, this is what they do. They're perform. This is their whole life. It's not like someone who goes, oh yeah, you know, I'm, I pick up the guitar, I go to the coffee shop. No, this is their life. This is what they know. How have you dealt with it? And did you go in waves? Like in the beginning you thought, oh, it might, it might stop. And then in the middle you said, oh shit. I mean, how have you dealt with it through the whole, the whole up and down? Because I'm sure it's been a cyclical for you. Right. Well, in the beginning, it was a bit of a novelty. I mean, for starters, this is the longest I've been in uh, my home or in one place at one time. This is the longest I've been uh, sedentary, let's say. Um, you know, uh, I'm in Los Angeles now for the most part. And, uh, you know, I have a palm tree and a swimming pool in the backyard. So, it, And the weather, obviously, is not as oppressive during the winters. And uh, so I was able to be very uh happy about that but um you know i right as the pandemic struck i was uh i was on a plane to mallorca right when it was kind of happening in china and i was in mallorca for a while uh doing some publicity for this documentary that sky arts uh produced about me that was going to be shown in may 2020 at the modern art museum in uh Mallorca and Palma. And uh, so I went over there and did press for it to lead up to um, the uh, debut of the, uh, the documentary was going to be in June. And I was going to go back in June. So then, uh, you know, I was aware of the pandemic happening in China. And uh, right after that, it was like late February, I had some recording sessions to do with uh, some friends of mine in, uh, in Pennsylvania and some gigs in, uh, in and around Manhattan. And that was sort of around the second week of March. So the, the week right before things really shut down, which is probably around St. Patrick's Day, I was uh, in a home studio with a couple of my friends. I have uh, one of my side projects is a band called Split Squad, 
with members of the Flesh Tones and uh, Eddie Munoz from the Plimp Souls and a guy called Mike Gibling. And uh, we were recording our second album. And of course, we were in the house for the most part and having dinner together at night and watching the news once again and thinking like, wow, this thing is starting to get out of hand a little bit. And we had a gig on that uh, Friday before St. Patrick's Day in Manhattan and then a couple of gigs in upstate New York. And uh, on that Thursday night, we decided that we weren't about to go into uh, Manhattan from Pennsylvania that night. And by Saturday, I was like on the phone, like, I got to get out of here. And I flew back here and that was it. But I I shared that week of kind of, uh, you know, the week of kind of trying to suss out what really was going to go down with the beginning of the pandemic with, with some very good friends. And so, and hard to believe that was over a year ago that that happened. So that really sticks in my mind. But um, in general, I had time now to do things that I didn't have time to do before. I actually did a lot of uh, house cleaning and uh, archival research. And uh, it's almost a cliche, but I'm halfway through my memoir that it's probably going to be published in 2022. And I really never had the time to do that prior. And uh, I was able to do that. And uh, also I was recording online and writing with other people online, you know, um, working on a rock opera of all things about London. So there was things to do, but you're right. The main thing I do is travel and perform live, do gigs. I mean, I have several other side projects outside of Blondie that are ongoing. One in particular is a band called The Empty Hearts with Elliot Easton and Wally Palmer from The Romantics. Elliot is, of course, from The Cars and uh, a guy called Andy Babuke from the band Chesterfield Kings. And our second album was due to come out in uh, February 2020. And then it came out in, we postponed it to August. And we were going to do a launch in August thinking that things might have calmed down by then, which it didn't. So that album came out and we did some uh, some videos online for that. And doing things like this. I mean, it's great, you know, these podcasts and, you know, it's really good. And it's really, and then my friend Jesse Mallon has a club, Bowery Electric in New York, and he was early on with uh, virtual concerts and uh, he would do one every Thursday. And that kind of like gave me something to look forward to and things like that. I mean, I've, I've been relatively busy and also somewhat content with not really having to have to travel as much as I usually do. Although yeah. I am looking forward to it. Yeah, I mean, I, I got to think, you know, just you're used to the charge of the stage. Years ago, yeah. I, I was a stand-up comic yeah. for uh, six years. And when I got out of it, I every once in a while, I'll go back and perform. And I love it. And then I go, I don't know if I'm yeah. driving all over. No. But, I mean, psychologically, do you, is there a withdrawal? Because you're used to the being behind the kit, kicking ass, people going crazy. I mean, when that, it's not like you would do it once in a while. You been on stage for a long time especially with all your side projects how does your body get used to that and do you have to like stay in shape because i want to talk about your drumming project the the study they did on you but how do you how do you do you have to start like practicing in the morning exercising the weights because you have to keep limber i'm sure to be performing all the time well i'm I'm a big advocate of physical fitness in general and since you brought it up you know the clemberg drumming project is an ongoing uh experiment let's say that's been going on for well over 10 plus years now that was started by myself and a guy called marcus smith who was the uh, uk olympic boxing coach and he's a sports medicine doctor and a professor at chichester university in the uk and you know he made that was making wanted to make that analogy between fitness sport and drumming which is very obvious as you just said so uh, yeah, I was always conscious of that. Uh, I started, uh, you know, exercising a long time ago for having basically to have a reason to get out of bed in the morning, at, in the down my downtime. And as time progressed, I realized that it was really helping me with my playing. So uh, that part of it was always kind of intact. And once again, with the weather in Southern California, I was able to get outside and jog and you know, the gyms were closed down. I kind of did have a withdrawal from not being able to go to the gym for a long time. That sort of uh, focus to, 
you know, in the morning and things like that. But, uh, yeah, I definitely tried to keep, I mean, everybody, I think, gained some weight during the pandemic, you know. It's, I mean, the two things I would think about, you wake up and first thing you're just thinking about is what am I going to have for dinner, you know, because yeah. it really like, wasn't that much to think about, you know. So, um, you know, there was that. And, of course, there's a lot of uh, sitting on the couch watching television and things like that that I wouldn't normally be doing as much. Um yeah, but in my my mind's eye, I was always kind of aware that I had to kind of try to keep it together. If I were just about to uh, do a gig with Blondie uh, in June, it looks like uh, we have a film. Uh, we were in Cuba right before the pandemic struck, somewhat before, and uh, we made a short documentary that's going to debut at uh, Tribeca Film Festival. And apparently uh, De Niro was on the other day online and saying that they're going to have the event being outdoors in, in Bryant Park, of course, the street from the public library on 42nd Street, Manhattan. And uh, we're going to probably do a little set when they, uh, after the film. So uh, looking forward to that. But that's going to be short, about 20 minutes. So we're kind of going to ease into it because our Debbie's been talking about doing three hour shows, which is kind of strikes me as funny because it's hard to get people to do 90 minutes usually. Can't we do 75 minutes? You know, But I think it's a, there's a pent-up excitement and the anxiety of not being able to perform, like we were saying, for people that is basically what they do in life. So people, I mean, what about Bruce, you know, Springsteen? I mean, I can't believe, you know, they were ready to do a tour. They did the album. Obviously, you know, it, it's it's most performers are well aware of the fact that, I mean, like Clarence Clemens used to call the stage the healing floor. You know, like everything kind of drops away when you're in the moment, when you're in a performance and, you know, the sort of life's ups and downs all kind of go away and you kind of focus on doing your gig. And that's what's great about playing music in general. You know, it's a release, it's a therapy. So uh, not having that definitely probably wrecked havoc on a lot of people's brains for sure. Now, you're a fellow in New Jersey, I like me. You're from North Jersey, I'm from South Jersey. Okay. When did you... When did you get into music? Was there a defining moment? Like so many people say, you know, I saw Ringo or I saw John Paul, jo you know, they all these different things, you know, whoever they play. What what got you into music? Well, I was in a musical household. My mother sang and played the piano. And, you know, I'd be going to school in the morning. She'd be like listening to top 40 radio and singing along to the hits of the day. And, you know, there were people like, I'm sure you may know, you know like Cousin Brucey and, WNCA good guys and things like that in the New York metro area. They were the, the, the top 40 DJs. And my dad was actually uh, had a band with his uh, brothers and his dad, kind of a semi kind of society wedding band for a while. Not when uh, we were a family, but as when he was younger. And so he was kind of a, he was a drummer. There was things like that kind of just kind of in my DNA, I suppose. But, uh, Every one of my generation cites the same thing. You know, the Beatles on Ed Sullivan, that was uh, the next day the world changed for, for kids, everybody talking about it at school. And, and then the other thing that was really kind of momentous for me was the, uh, you know, the, the film The Kids Are All Right, the Who movie uh, that my friend Jeff Stein directed. Uh, I distinctly remember being in grammar school and seeing The Who on Smothers Brothers and then the next day that, that really kind of set me off on, uh, you know, my journey somewhat as well. But really, the, the Four Seasons and the Beatles, we used to have fights in the schoolyard. You know, some people would be Four Seasons fans, especially in Jersey. Uh, four Seasons versus the Beatles. Then there was a lot of sort of my older cousins who were kind of like rockers, greasers, you know, they kind of really didn't like the Beatles. Like, they kind of liked, you know, they liked the Four Seasons or they liked Gene Vincent or things like that. So, uh, you know, uh that was that set the stage for me. The, the music of the, the early '60s, really. Do you ever do you ever run into people you knew back then that you were playing music with, and they go, "Holy crap! You you always said you wanted to play music, and now you're you know you, you've been in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, you've toured. Like, do people sit there? Did they go? I mean, did they expect it? Like now, did they go? Because you always hear this probably, like, we knew we knew that club work would make it big someday. But did you have, did you run into people that you, that have told you stories about seeing you when you were starting out once in a while i get uh, online messages from people that you know saw me uh play with my band so, because really once uh, the beatles hit 
I mean, from the time I was 12 years old, you know, I was into, I was like focused on playing music and I'm really good friends with uh, two or three of the people from my, uh, the band I had in high school in my junior and senior years of high school. And uh, actually we, I've got a Zoom call set up with them uh, coming up on Friday. And we you know we've remained friends and uh, the thing for me that really helped was the scene that was going on in uh, Lower Manhattan. Uh, prior to CBGB, there was a club called Club 82, uh, where they would have bands on a Wednesday night, and I would uh, kind of hang out there, and that's where the New York Dolls would play, or behind me right now, uh, my heroes. And uh, also, other sort of, uh, was kind of like the glam rock, glitter rock scene that was going on, which I kind of like was focused on, uh, I really like David Bowie a lot. David Bowie kind of informed after the Beatles it was David Bowie for me, as far as connecting the dots as to really what I wanted to do. And, uh, with Blondie as well, you know, with Bowie, we always admired his kind of chameleon outlook on his music. You know, he would always be changing. You never knew what to expect from him. He would, he would change genres. And, uh, in 1972, when I was a kid, uh, I went to uh, Carnegie Hall to see the Ziggy Stardust and Spiders from Mars uh, concert, and uh, that was kind of life-changing for me as well. And uh, I, uh, after that, I was on a mission to find my my Bowie or my Jagger or my Jim Morrison. And uh, I've said this many times before, I found that person in Debbie Harry. You know? How did you guys actually meet? I mean, as you said, you hung out at one bar. You know, I've talked to different people. I talked to Richard Lloyd from television, you talked about when the whole scene was starting. And you know, you think about it now, and CBGB is gone, and all these places, Max, they're all gone. But you think about then, there, at one time, there was no scene. And to people like me, I'm, I'm 57, that's fascinating to me, because we think about this music we love, and it wasn't there. I mean, how did you get involved in that scene, which you were pretty much on the forefront of? Right, well, um, I had a band called Sweet Revenge, which was kind of like a, a glam rock band or influenced by by people like Bowie, Mott the Hoople, uh, Mark Bolin. And uh, it was the, really the first band of uh, that I was into where we were doing all basically mostly original material. And uh, the club that I was talking about, Club 82, the band that I was in, Sweet Revenge, we managed to get a gig at Club 82, and it's where uh, Debbie and her partner Chris had a band called the Stilettos, and they would perform there, and uh, also Wayne County would play there, and uh, a lot of other bands, a band called Teenage Lust, uh, and uh, I was hanging around that, that scene, and I was a big uh, admirer and fan of the New York Dolls, and kind of uh, would go to New York Dolls shows as often as I could and uh, just kind of assimilated myself into that scene somewhat and then uh, there was actually an ad in the Village Voice and back in the days of pre-internet obviously you know the, the back of the help wanted section you know would have you know, if you're looking for an apartment or if you're looking for a used car or an instrument or uh, members of a band so uh, you know I would peruse the uh, the uh, back pages of the Village Voice, and there was an ad that uh, Debbie Harry and Chris Stein had placed looking for a drummer. And I already knew that it was them when I spoke to them on the telephone, and I was aware of what was happening on the whole kind of uh, evolution of the New York, for a better word, lack of a better word, underground music scene in New York, which kind of started at, as I said, Club, well, Club 82 and Mercer Art Center, which was a little bit before my time where the New York Dolls would play. And uh, interestingly enough, you know, Club 82 was 82 East 4th Street, which is basically directly around the corner, one block west of CBGB. So it's almost like uh, all the sort of glam rockers kind of cut their hair and took their platform <laughs> shoes off and put their sneakers on and walked, walked a block uh, west and uh, wound up at CBGB, you know. What, so it was connected. What was the... What, did, did you guys feel energy when you first started playing together? Because, you know, any band that stays long for a long time and hits certain levels, 
there has to be a good chemistry. But when you walk in and, you know, people don't understand now, you can go on the Internet and you can see someone talking. You can go, oh, that person looks like a jerk and I want to audition for him. But then, as you said, there was you didn't know. You just pick up the paper and you go, oh, this, you know. So when you walked in, when you first, how, how long do you guys knew that there was a good synergy? Like you just said, this, these are the right pieces. Well, from my point of view, when I, when I first met up with, with uh, my partners in Blondie, uh, you know, there was a bass player, Fred Smith, who famously quit Blondie to go on to join the band Television, which is when I brought my friend Gary Valentine, which is a school friend of mine, who also hung out with me at Club 82. I brought him into the fall with Lonnie, but I think we um, all kind of picked up our initial meetings. Uh, obviously, I was impressed with, with Debbie's charisma, with her uh, star quality, let's say, and uh, her sort of uh, innocence at the same time. And uh, I was looking for people that were creative and, uh, you know, writing and doing their own, their own original material, along with cover songs a uh, common aesthetic and I think when they met me I always say famously they liked my shoes because it is kind of a grab bag of uh, there's a bit of apprehension because you said you don't really know who this person is or what they look like until they show up on your doorstep let's say you know for an interview or for a, an audition or whatever so you know you a lot of people probably you know they walk in the door and the next minute you know they, they're out the door you know based on their profile or whatever, you know, and uh, I think we kind of all kind of picked up on each other's uh, aesthetic, let's say, when we first met and uh, in conversation, you know, we had common denominators in the musical influences, whether it be, you know, the girl groups, the Ronettes, the Shangri-Las, uh, or like garage rock, or like even like bubblegum music, like I love like the Ohio Express and the 1910 Fruit Gum Company and you know, the Beach Boys, and so uh, that was all kind of outside of what the uh, main reality of rock and roll was at the time, you know, because it, not there was anything wrong with it, but it was all, you know, the Led Zeppelins, the Foreigners, and things like that. They were kind of more blues-oriented, and, you know, it was a, a different, and the, and the prog rock things, you know, but um, getting back to my high school days, I was the bands. I was in two bands primarily in high school, and that became my social life. And we would actually play and make money, you know, at, at CYO dances, at Jewish community centers, uh, you know, shopping mall openings, all those kind of things that you you hear about that don't really exist as much, I think, today as it did back then. So, and we were learning from the cover songs, but my bands were always successful. Uh, I, you know, I'm writing my memoir, so there's a lot of stuff about all of that in it. But, you know, I had this band called Total Environment, and we, uh, the DJ Cousin Brucey, WABC, he's on Sirius Radio now on the, on the 60s station. Uh, he would have this thing called Cousin Brucey's Big Break, where you would make a recording of your band and send it in, and they would listen to it, and then they would put you in a studio wabc studio to record the song professionally so it's the first time i was ever in a studio at wabc on 56th and, and 7th or broadway or something like that and uh we came into the finals and every year the, they would have it in a ballroom somewhere like at a hilton ballroom and the year that we were in the finals for this cousin brucey's so-called big break it was held at carnegie hall so i'm 14 years old and playing at carnegie hall so you know, and so I was like, is it going to be downhill from here? I've already played at <laughs> Carnegie Hall, you know, but uh, so there was always kind of that thing in, in back of my mind that maybe I could be a success at, at doing this. So and my, like I said, my bands were always kind of earned. We earned money, you know, a hundred dollars, you know, per man on, you know, when you're 14 years old at a dance or something. So. So, so when you well, what what shoes were you wearing? What what shoes fascinated him when you met the group? Oh, I had, I had some red red shoes on. Actually, they were red sort of platform shoes. That's good. It was a good choice <laughs> that day. And I had a I saw a picture of Keith Moon, a uh, famous picture of him wearing a U.S. Uh, sailor's uh, shirt. I had that on as well. So I had the long hair then. Well, you see, that was it was the right look. Now, now, what was it like in the early gigs? 
when you were playing New York, like, you know, was there a lot of hell gigs? What were the crowds like? Because it was, it was once again, it was the beginning of a new scene, as you say, the underground scene. It was something starting new. What was it like cutting your teeth as a band in front of New York crowds? And not we're not talking like big, I mean, we're talking clubs, New York well, clubs. Okay, first, first, I wouldn't use the word crowds because it was a handful of people. You know, it was a very uh, small uh selective group of people at CBGB when we first started playing in the early days of early 1975. Um, most of the people in the audience would be people that were in the other bands that were playing. Very few women and just really a handful of people would be the members of television or the Ramones. Uh, you know, the Ramones artistic director Arturo Vega had a loft around the corner from CBGB, which is now Joey Ramone Place. And uh, Dee Dee and Joey Ramone both lived in the loft as well. So CBGB was virtually, uh, you know, 100 yards away from the, where they uh, lived. So they would always be there at CBs. And uh, the thing is, they would play very late at night, too. That was always the crazy thing, because at the time I was going to college, and I was also working uh, at the post office at, at different times at, uh, like the holidays and things like that. So, uh, you know, if, if you headlined at CDs or even if you were second on it, but you'd usually want to play in at 11, 12 o'clock at night, and then there would be a second show around 2, two o'clock because, of course, the bars stay open until 4 a.m. in, in uh, New York State. So uh, <clears throat> it was a very late night scene. So, you know, you'd have to take the disco nap and things like that, you know, and <clears throat> be out virtually all night and then uh, – you know, I would have to get up to uh, either go to work or go to a class. And uh, it was like full, full on 24 7. And, uh, you know, there was no uh, no money to be had. You know, it was on the Bowery. It was, everything was a very sparse existence. But, you know, that's kind of what we did. So um, the response was gradual. You know, the, the, the thing about CBGB, I always say, it was kind of like a workshop. You're able to make your mistakes in public, unlike nowadays when everyone is thing is online, as you said. And uh, comedians have the worst deal about that. You know, as far as you know, once somebody captures their their act on a phone and puts it up on the internet, I mean, that's it. I, I went to see uh, Dave Chappelle at Radio City a couple of years ago, and then they did those little lock boxes for the phone. I don't know if you've seen those. Yeah. They put them in the envelope and they seal it and they take your phone. And then you know when you're when you're walking out, they, they unlock it for you. And uh, you know, obviously, none of that existed. There was a guy called Bob Gruen, the, the very well-known photographer, uh, was uh, documenting uh, the scene very early on. He had a, one of those original. You remember the old video porta packs? You know, they were like the, the deck was like that, about that big and the huge camera. But you know, things were pretty done under the radar. You know, as you could develop your. Uh, your act, let's say, or your songs. You could play your songs that weren't necessarily completed. You know, Heart of Glass was a work in progress for a very long time. It went through many different incarnations, and, you know, we would perform it once in a while, along with a, a lot of the other songs that wound up on uh, various uh, Blondie records. And, uh, you know, it was an open format. I mean, the thing was, the criteria at CBGB was it basically mostly to play original music, and uh, to have a workshop platform to uh, to t present your uh, your music, so it was good that way. Now, you're playing the CBGB, CBGB. When do you guys get your your first break? I mean, you know, even if it was just a minuscule break, when did you sit there and have confidence going? You know what? We're going somewhere. People believe in us. Well, um, early on, there was a guy called Marty Thau who was the uh, original New York Dolls manager who showed a, a, a big interest in uh, in us. And there was a guy called Alan Betrock who went on to uh, start a, a newspaper called New York Rocker. Uh, Alan is the first person to put us in the studio. We went to a basement studio in Queens and recorded a demo. Uh, one of the songs on the demo was the so-called disco song, which turned into Heart of Glass later on. Uh, along with uh, three or four other songs that actually never really uh, were professionally recorded later on. 
And uh, Alan was, a, you know, a, call him an influencer, tastemaker. And Marty, uh, you know, had a history of, uh, you know, management. And uh, Marty was working with a guy called uh, Richard Goddard and a guy called Craig Leon. Uh, and uh, Marty brought us to uh, to Richard and Craig, and uh, Richard had uh, recently left uh, his partnership in Sire Records with Seymour Stein and was starting his own independent uh, production company along with Craig Leon. Craig Leon went on to produce the first Ramones album and uh, produced the album by uh, Suicide. And uh, actually, Craig Leon produced uh, our so-called comeback album, No Exit, back in the late 90s. And... Uh, you know, these sort of music professionals showing an interest in the band was uh, a great, uh, you know, positive reinforcement for us. And uh, we, uh, especially Richard Goddard, was a hit songwriter. He was in a band called The Strange Loves. He wrote uh, Nighttime, uh, I Want Candy. He also wrote, famously wrote My Boyfriend's Back. So he had a history with girl groups. So they kind of were able to nurture us a little bit and move us along. So that was probably the uh, the main thing, and uh, you know, getting a keyboard player early on, uh, a guy called Jimmy Destry, uh, added tremendously to the sound of the band as well. When did you get your first record deal, and, and what is that feeling like? You know, people sit there like you know, so you see, and I'm a I'm a big sports fan. You watch the draft, and people get drafted, and like you know, they they're calling their family, especially in the NFL, and their family is there. Is it the same feeling when you when you know you're a musician and they go, hey, you know what, we're going to sign you? I mean, what is what feelings go through you, and how did you get that deal? Well, our whole uh, rise to success, let's say, was was very gradual, and there was not a lot of money involved, so it wasn't really like uh, you know that kind of feeling. Uh, we had a wound up getting a. a a deal for a, a 45, a song called X Offender, uh, with a label called Private Stock that we uh, came to via Richard Goddard's production deal. So we were signed to a production deal with Richard. And uh, we recorded the 45. And uh, I always remember to this day, people always ask, what was it like the first time you heard your song on the radio? Uh, for me, it was the first time I heard the song played on the jukebox at CBGB. You know, you'd be in the club, and there was only a few records by local acts on that jukebox, Patti Smith and uh, maybe the Ramones' first single and a uh, uh, song called Little Johnny Jewel that television released independently. And, uh, and then the rest of the jukebox would be things like MC5 or the Stooges or Question Mark and the Mysterians. So uh, to be in the club and to hear that song come over the uh, speakers of the jukebox and the fact that someone actually went in and put their 25 cents in the jukebox to play it was it was really exciting for me and so the, the sort of grassroots success of the single led to uh, a, a deal to make an album with private stock and which we were paid uh, in advance of uh, five thousand dollars i was just looking through some of my old contracts because with my memoir i'm, I'm planning on incorporating a lot of my archival stuff and things that people haven't seen before. And I remember our, our lawyer later on had a contract uh, framed in, on his wall in his office with Jimi Hendrix had signed a contract for not $5,000, for $1, right? So, uh, but, you know, that's kind of how the way these things go. And uh, I don't know if artists or kids today can appreciate that. You know, you kind of got to, jump into the fire, you know, you have to have a leap of faith. And uh, I think Keith Richards once said it was the, the price of an education, you know, to kind of basically get ripped off or not to say we were completely ripped off, but, you know, everything was on a very low scale. It wasn't a lot of money involved. And uh, when we made that first album, the biggest thing for us was we got invited on the tour. There was the artist Iggy Pop had the, uh, a record called The Idiot that was produced by David Bowie. And uh, they were doing a national tour in the U.S. and uh, we were invited to be the opening act. So that kind of really uh, cemented the idea that, uh, you know, we could go out and uh, do a national tour. And not only that, we were kind of being represented by 
or presented by David and Iggy, you know, like we kind of got their seal of approval, like really early on. This is in 77. So that was really a major for us. So that national tour, I mean, the, the album wasn't any big success, but it, it set us on the path to, uh, to keep going. As a drummer, is do you feel the difference of playing, let's say, as you said, in front of a few people, musicians, and then you get on that tour, you're playing in front of a bigger crowd. Do you feed off that energy or are you in a zone that, you know, you're pretty much in once you get behind the kit? No, I definitely feed off the energy of the crowd, especially, well, in a packed club, for sure you feed off of it. But for me, you know, people always say, you know, which do you prefer, the smaller gig? I mean, the bigger, the better. If you're playing to 50,000 people at a festival or 100,000 people is probably the most we ever played to with Blondie, you definitely get swept up in the energy of the crowd. But it's also, you have to kind of put yourself back into the mindset of when you were playing in that club or expecting to try to reach all these people is a very, you know, difficult thing in a lot of ways. But when you see... It's it's a it's a give and take, you know. It, it, the, the 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 response from the audience fuels any performer, I think. You know, if you're a comedian, you tell a joke and you get a big laugh, that probably, you know, gets you vibed up to like you know carry on with your act or, you know, anything. You know, when a ball player hits a home run and every standing ovations and all that, all kind of spurs you on. And yeah, of course, that that's what uh, what uh, people feed off of for sure in a live performance. So. Yeah. As Blondie's getting bigger, and you're getting bigger, and then you get huge, how does it affect your life as an individual, and also as a band, because things change a lot different. You know, you're going from being in a van <laughs> to being in a bus. It's like, okay, if we were bitching at each other in the band, I can sit on that end of the bus. I mean, when at what point did you start getting, to, in your eyes, really big? Well, you know, the success of Blondie was our downfall at the same time. You know, it was a double-edged sword because uh, in some ways maybe we didn't have to try as hard or we had gave us ourselves a little more time to do things and it, it was less uh, work intensive. And, uh, you know, you don't get a especially back then, you don't really get a, a playbook, let's say. You don't get a manual with how to deal with your success. So it affects people in different ways. And uh, we did a tremendous amount of work prior to our real success. So I think some of the people in the band felt as though, you know, they could take a little bit of a break from the intensive uh, work ethic we had early on. And, uh, you know, then you earn some money and you don't have to really necessarily – do a gig or whatever to, uh, you know, to worry about paying the rent, let's say, or pay the mortgage. So, um, you know, we had a, a slow rise to success, but uh, then we kind of, uh, we took a break after uh, we recorded the uh, album Auto American, which had tremendous success with Rapture and Tide is High, but we didn't tour behind it. And uh, I think that was a part of our downfall. I'm not sure what the question was, but uh, that's interesting. How was your life changing as you guys got it bigger? Like you have the, I mean, besides the work ethic, as you said, or just you know doing touring or things like that. How does your life change? So all of a sudden, people are probably recognizing you because you know people watch videos, and and is it is it a weird feeling when I mean people knew of you, but then all of a sudden, Blondie's everywhere. I mean, it's got to be an infringement into your personal life somewhat. Well. As far as I was concerned, everything was kind of going according to plan. You know, I was kind of in, in, you know, my focus was on being a success in the music business. So I really didn't mind those things. Of course, the the emphasis on the whole notoriety was kind of shifted a bit to Debbie, obviously, being this glamorous woman, uh, being something very kind of uh, different at the time. And uh, although... You know, standard practices, whether it be Mick Jagger or Brian Ferry or whatever, the, the singer is always going to stand out in uh, the media. So uh, some people kind of resented that within the band. I always kind of thought that 
in a way, I kind of feel like I discovered, you know, Debbie Harry in a way, because, you know, when we got together, we, the three of us who remain in the band today, Chris, Debbie, and myself, are the, kind of the nucleus of the band. And, yeah, I thought she was amazing as the front person, and, and she deserved the uh, notoriety and uh, the success that she got along with uh, the, that the rest of the band got as well. Um, none of that stuff really bugged me uh, particularly. I mean, we were all living in Manhattan. It was a kind of a close, close community. I mean, it, you know, you got a better, you know, seat at a restaurant and things like that, which was like always oh, was was all good. It was fun, but the, you know, the success came a lot sooner than the, than the uh, actual uh, economic rewards. I mean, I think anybody kind of knows that. You know, you get successful, but you're not necessarily breaking in like tons of money because the pipelines and the debt. I mean. We signed with uh, the big change was we went from the company called Private Stock to a company called Chrysalis Records who signed us for the, uh, we were making the second album for Private Stock, but our manager, a guy called Peter Leeds, was negotiating a new record deal with Chrysalis, which basically what happened was it was the second album called Plastic Letters was funded by Private Stock and released on Chrysalis by the time it was ready for release. And Chrysalis signed us for a million dollars. But that million dollars went to buying out our production deal and our record deal, which we had signed for $5,000. We were bought out of that deal for $500,000. So, um, you know, we, uh, it, it needed to be done. But basically, we were a million dollars in debt at the time. So... Uh, Back then, it took a little while to uh, recoup that advance. And, of course, making videos, uh, traveling, tour support, it all had to be done in order to attain the success that we finally did receive, and uh, which is kind of ongoing, funny enough, to this day. So um, I guess I, my answer is my life really didn't change all that much with the initial success of the band. I, I had uh, family issues that I had to take care of. Uh, my dad, my dad uh, was not well, and uh, that gave me the time. The layoff gave me the time to kind of, kind of take care of those types of things. But um, it was all good, though. I mean, I definitely appreciate it. I never, I never took things for granted. I still try not to take things for granted as far as my success, especially during a pandemic. I realized how lucky I was to be in a position that I was in and not have to uh, worry about the essentials of life. You know. Now, what you disband? When you guys disbanded, was there a certain reason? And um, of course, after you disbanded, you just went on and played with amazing people. Which, when wow. you look at it, it was probably somewhat of a ble- not a blessing in disguise to play with such talented people like you did. But was there a certain reason, or was it just like so many bands go? You know what? We ran our course for right now. Maybe we'll come back and revisit it. Well, as I mentioned, uh, after the tremendous success of uh, the album "Auto American." And uh, the, the singles from that Todd Sign Rapture, we, we didn't tour. And then uh, after about two years, we made a record called The Hunter, which wasn't as much of a success. And then we did a tour. And then, uh, you know, it's been well documented. Uh, Chris Stein uh, got uh, seriously ill. And we had uh, tours booked for Japan, for the UK. And we did a tour in 1982 in the US that wasn't tremendously successful our opening act was duran duran who uh i had seen in a club in new york and uh with with myself and our bass player nigel harrison saw them play at a club called hurrahs and invited them to come on this u.s tour with us the national tour and that was kind of the beginning of their rise to success in, in the states actually and uh you know i would have preferred to have just taken a break but one of the main reasons why we didn't take a break was because uh as I said, Chris uh, got seriously ill, and at first, no one really was sure what he uh, had, what was wrong with him, and it was really at the beginning of the whole AIDS epidemic, and, uh, you know, no one really knew. That wasn't what he had, but he was sick for quite some time, and things kind of just kind of fell by the wayside after that. It's kind of really strange when you think about it all, how it all played out, but uh, it did play out that way. Uh, in writing, in my memoir, I, I tried to uh, think of the, the good times that we had, but I, I find myself going back to when the band stopped working and, and the reasons why. And, and people, 
like my editor like keeps questioning well you sure this did this really happen like this i'm like yeah it did well what was the reason like you're asking and no one really seems to know in some ways it's very strange in that regard is that hard to write for you writing your memoir like when you write about the the down times like i I talked to tony hadley from spandau ballet two weeks ago and he said when he watched the documentary documentary about him he said watching it he can't watch it because he feels the tension and it makes him feel like crap um for when you write that that. is it hard for you to delve into that because it's got to take you back to an emotional time which you think you're past it but it's still probably in the back of your mind yeah well when you revisit it i mean things worked out for the best along the way but uh, yeah when you tend to revisit it and that's why i kind of as far as my writing i kind of go off, get off the topic of blondie i kind of editorialize about other things in my life that kind of influenced me i'm writing a, a huge piece about the new york dolls right now and and I'll, also my work with other artists like pete townsend for instance so i kind of put the the, the blondie stuff on the back burner a while for the for the memoir uh talking about tony uh i uh <laughs> Uh, right before in October, before you know, 2020, I, I did a. You may or may not know this, but I did a few tours with a couple of friends of mine who actually have a Blondie tribute band called Bootleg Blondie. I don't know. Did you ever hear about this? I was reading it earlier. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, it, it was really loads of fun, you know. And uh, it, I kind of curated the set where uh, you know we were doing a lot of material that we don't normally do in Blondie nowadays. And the, the two people, Andy and Debbie. Uh, are the, are the people that have the band called like Blondie, and they've they become friends of mine over the years. They were big Blondie fans. So uh, they invited me to do a guest appearance with them, and one thing led to another, and I wound up traveling around the UK with them and doing some shows. But one of the last things we did was we did like a retro cruise from uh, Southampton in the UK to La Havre, France, a three-day basically booze fest for the, all these crazy people. The whole theme was like 80s, like people were dressing up like Adam Ann or Boy George or Debbie Harry, and we're all on this luxury liner. And uh, one of the other acts on the on the on this cruise was Tony Hadley. And so, well, uh, Tony, I uh, had known from a mutual friend called John Ferreter, who was uh, planning on working with Tony. Unfortunately, John is no longer with us. And so, uh, Tony wound up uh, getting on stage with us with the bootleg Blondie, and we did a, a cover of the jam song called Town Called Malice with Tony. It was really fun, and he, he's, a, he's a really good guy. That Since you brought up Tony, I, he's a friend of mine. But, uh, yeah, I mean, people want to move forward. I mean, I think if you're a really a, an artist, let's say, you don't really want to dwell on your past. You want to move forward. I mean, look at somebody like Neil Young or Bruce Springsteen or – you know, they're constantly doing new music, whether it's so how much it sells is almost irrelevant. It's just they have to do it. With Blondie, we've made, uh, you know, three or four or five records since we reformed. You know, they weren't the biggest sellers. But as a matter of fact, the last album that we did, Pollinator, is probably I'm not just saying this, but it's probably one of our best albums. And, uh, you know, you continue on to uh, to create new music is a big part of being an artist. I'm not sure where I'm going with this, but, oh, to be into the future is kind of more more positive than to kind of rehash the past. But it's a, it's a necessary evil right now for me because I'm recounting the past. Now, you, you, the Empty Hearts, you know, uh, Wally's in it, and I've oh. interviewed Wally. He's a great guy. He was a romantic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, great guy. You played drums with the Romantics for a while. Is that what led to the Empty Hearts? How did that whole thing happen? And how did you get Elliot involved? Because it's like, it's just a really cool group. Yeah. I mean, Elliot and I have been friends since uh, the Cars days. The, blonde, the success of Blondie and the Cars, we crossed paths quite a bit at different MTV events. And uh, I think we had the same accountant for a while in New York, a guy called Bert Fidel. And uh, Elliot and I uh, tried to start a, a a band started a group a while ago with the the late uh, Doug Figer from the Knack, and uh, Elliot and I always planned on tr- trying to do a a project, a band together. And uh, Andy Bapuke uh, was basically the uh, the main uh, prime mover of uh, getting the four of us together because we, Andy was a mutual friend of all of us, ours. 
Andy uh, famously uh, put together the, the book called Beatles Gear, the coffee table book. He's also done the Rolling Stones gear. He's getting on a book about the Bigsby, the uh, Bigsby Tremolo, you know, the creator of that. And uh, Andy uh, worked in a guitar shop in Rochester, New York, that that we all would pass through if we were in Rochester. And he now has his own guitar shop called Fab Gear outside of Rochester. And uh, he kind of made the phone calls. And, of course, I was friends with Wally from my years with Romantics. I was friends with Elliot. And Andy was a friend. So uh, it kind of was a natural uh, progression for us to get together. But uh, we were hoping to play a lot more. The, the, the ironic thing is we were created to really go out and, and be a live band and, and play a, a heck of a lot. And for one reason or another, we haven't been able to do that. And, uh, I mean, we toured, we have played, but not to the extent that we originally envisioned it. But uh, the Empty Hearts are ongoing. One of the reasons I'm happy to do uh, your show and to do various podcasts is to let people know about the Empty Hearts. We have two records. The last one came out in August on uh, Wicked Cool, Stephen Van Zandt's record label. Uh, produced by Ed Stasium, who's uh, also like the fifth member of Empty Hearts. And uh, there's a guest appearance by uh, Ringo Starr on it, on drums. I play tambourine along with Ringo on drums on one track. And, uh, yeah, that's kind of how it came together. It kind of We kind of wanted to let all the uh, sort of uh, inhibitions and uh, the uh, baggage of being in the music business for as long as we all have been, kind of drop away and kind of get back to that sort of, uh, you know, what it was like to start a band back when, like at school, you know, when friends got together and and started playing music together. So we kind of tried to have that as kind of be our muse as we went along. And it's been, as far as creating the music, it's been very successful. There's a real chemistry and we all have uh, a lot of similar tastes in, in music. So it, it kind of all works. Now you had played with Wally, so you already right then you have a relationship. Right. When the other two gentlemen joined you, do you have to get used to their playing? Because it's something that you know you play with so many different people. So and every drummer I talk to, drummers just pick it up. And I'm not I'm not just saying this because you're on my show, but drummers are the coolest people. You guys are like the backbone of a, of a band. I mean, people don't think about that. You know, like it's like baseball. You have the shortstop and the second base, but that's the infield. Drumming, I mean, drummer and bass. That's like the foundation of a band what is it like when you sit there and you you start playing with someone you know their work like you knew elliot's work but when you sit there and you actually start jamming together do you pick up on each other like do you pick up like oh i know this i know this where it's going because i've heard notice stuff or is it just something that you don't have any idea what direction it's going to go in well in the case of the empty hearts there's definitely intuitiveness and also the uh the grassroots influences of, of each of us are very, very similar. So, uh, yeah, there's a synergy that exists within the band. Uh, maybe if, I, if I'm doing a session for an artist that I'm not particularly uh, aware of or going into trying to create something that uh, I'm hearing for the first time, you know, you have to kind of, kind of feel things out, maybe chart it out and kind of, you know, run through it a few times, but uh, with certain things, the sort of uh, the sort of intuitiveness and, and the, the basics kind of take over, and uh, everybody's kind of on the same page musically. So that's really what happened with the Empty Hearts. I mean, we started writing material right away, and also jamming on you know all all the stuff from the '60s. You know, the Kinks, the Who, the Yardbirds. That's kind of like our, our main influences. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, the drums are the foundation. Uh, I mean, I'm definitely a dinosaur nowadays. I mean, drums are not exactly, uh, you know, you press a button in the studio and you got your drums, you know. So, How does that make you feel as a purist, man, as someone who is banging out the whole life? I mean, it's something that you must love technology, but you must say, man, wait a second, man. I, I've worked my ass off to get this down, and now someone can just push a button. How does that make you feel as a, as a you know, someone who's very established, you're a rock and roll hall of famer, you've played with tons of people. How does that make you feel when you sit there and go, Christ, a button? Yeah, well, I feel like I'm a survivor, but you know, we incorporated technology with Bondi early on. I mean, Heart of Glass is probably one of the first songs to, uh, you know, use the drum machine along with the, the drummer, as it is. And uh, it, it doesn't really bother me because of the place I'm in in my life. If I... Uh, 
was just starting out, it might be a little more difficult. So, I mean, you have to accept technology. Rock and roll has always kind of uh, been based on technology, whether it be the electric guitar or, you know, uh, advancements in amplification or it's just kind of ongoing. You just kind of have to accept the technology as you move along in your career. Um, you know, I find myself being invited to sessions where people want to have live drums. So I'm, I'm fortunate in that way. And of course my forte is the live performance. You know, I, I think that's the one thing that you can't really, you know, replicate in any other way that the whole sort of, which is what's so strange about the pandemic shutting down live performance and so many small independent music venues closing is a sort of a big problem as well for, I think for new acts and, uh, hoping that everything is going to kind of uh, get back to semi-normal sooner than later. But I think there's a, I feel like I'm a survivor in general, you know, of, of the music business. I was lucky enough to, to be in a band that was a massive success and did earn a good bit of money along the way. and enables me to, to kind of go off and do other things in, in uh, my musical life. So I, I feel fortunate that way. Is it hard for you to transition from when you're playing with the Empty Hearts, and I know you also play with the International Swingers, and you play with different bands, and you play with these groups, and then you go back to Blondie. What is that like making a transition? Because with the Empty Hearts, you know, you're playing songs that are new, but Blondie, you're playing songs that you've played for years. Is it something that you're excited for the crowd, but you're sort of like, I want to be keep creating? What goes through your head when they say, okay, we're going on tour? Well, it's like going on vacation. Like when we tour with Blondie, I mean, it's, you know, it's just fairly, very luxurious. And, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, I don't mind playing the old material. We play new material as well. Um, to me, it's all like one long song, you know, when you do a performance. People always say, well, what songs do you like to play, songs you don't like to play? I mean, I just enjoy being in the moment, being on stage and, and, and playing. And there's so many great songs in the Blondie catalog that, you know, it, it really doesn't uh, disturb me at all to do, uh, let's say, Heart of Glass, for instance. I mean, it's great when you see the reception it gets. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, it's a, it's a, the, the process, whether it be touring in a van or recording in someone's home studio or playing in front of uh, a festival crowd of 100,000. It's all kind of uh, synonymous with one another in a lot of ways. You know, it's, it's, it's the process. It's a... It's being a musician, it's it's creating or performing or being in the moment and just kind of getting that uh, feedback from the audience. And uh, the process is the most important thing, I think. If you stop doing it, then you're kind of like out of luck, which is one of my trepidations about, you know, not doing it for this past year uh, on the level that I normally do. One final question. Okay. What made you decide to write your memoirs? I'm sure people came up to you in the past. Was it the pandemic that finally put you in gear to do it? I and mean, I'm sure it's been you've been approached before. What made you sit there now and say, you know what? I'm getting this shit done and I'm going to take my time. And, I, you know, writing is a hard process. People don't understand yeah. when you're soul searching, when you're looking at yourself, who's the biggest critic of ourselves? ourselves. So when you're right, you're probably like, oh, wait a second, this sucks. Wait, you know, or then, you know, I mean... What made you decide to do it? Well, things like this, for instance, over the years, if I was doing an interview, uh, inevitably, nine out of ten times, someone like you would say, you know, you really ought to do a book. You really got a lot of uh, history there, and you've worked with a lot of different people, and uh, the success that you've had uh, with Blondie, and the backstory to all these things in conjunction with what happened, everything that happened in New York in the mid-70s, and... Uh, I had had offers in the past. There was a guy in the UK called Chris Charlesworth who used to be the editor at uh, the, the music press, uh, the, the newspaper Melody Maker, which no longer exists. He's written several books about the Who, and uh, he was uh, an editor at a company called Omnibus in the UK who does a lot of uh, music uh, books. And uh, he approached me early on and, and a few other people did as well. And I, I was writing bits and pieces along the way and I have diaries and things like that. But, you know, to answer your question, really the pandemic is what really set me off on it. And the, and the, uh, I have a really great collaborator, a guy called Ira Robbins, who was, uh, had a magazine back in the day called the trouser press. 
And I think like Blondie was on the cover maybe four or five times. And Trouser Press started out as a magazine that was basically devoted to uh, British music. And then as the punk rock and the new wave and the New York scene happened, they kind of encapsulated all of that in their magazine as well. So uh, Ira and I have been longtime friends. So he's really great. I really have a great uh, collaborative work uh, ethic with, with Ira. So that was a big help when, uh, when we uh, decided to, to work together. So, um, yeah, that was really it. People asking me about, about doing it for a long time. And I, I really want to, you know, have it be uh, to include a lot of the archival stuff as well. So that people that things that people haven't seen old photos and things like that. So it definitely kept me occupied. I mean, you could sit down at the computer you know, five or six hours go by, you don't even realize that you've been writing that long. It's a great, but then, you know, you kind of feel kind of uh, energized, but also said that the whole nostalgic aspect of it kind of feel like you're in a different place in time in a way. You're kind of out of your body for the moment, you know, you're, you're reminiscing and thinking back to these things that happened along the way. And of course, it, it, it inevitably going to be subjective. It's the way you saw it, the way it happened for you. And you know, it's it's interesting. It's interesting, but I'm getting a lot of positive feedback, so did, we'll see. I hope to have it done by September. Do you have I, a title? Because I, I think that's usually the hardest part. Did you come up with a title? The, the, the title is called "The Other Side of the Train." Okay. And so my, my life in an inside in and out of Blondie. The other side of the dream. It's like the, you know, the reality of what I wanted to have happen happened, but it was a dream at one time. You know, and all the things that happened to me and uh, you know, whether it be, uh, you know, playing in front of live audiences, getting that record deal, being on television, being on the radio, being in the media, uh, being able to make a living doing what I love to do. All those things happened. And they were there at one time. They were all a dream, you know, and, and, and the goalpost keeps changing. So, uh, it's called the other side of the dream. That's about it. That's awesome. I want to thank you. Now you're on. You're on. I, I know you tweet a lot. What's your Twitter handle? It's, it's Clem Burke at the you know, Twitter. So, Clem Burke. so people follow yeah. Clem on Twitter. Follow me on Twitter. It's at Cooper Talk. Go to my website CooperTalk.net. You can find over 845 episodes. Email me at Cooper at CooperTalk.net. Remember, I'm Steve Cooper. I'm only as hip as my guest. Don't forget, drink your water, eat your vegetables, take your vitamins, and I'll talk to you guys next time. Thank you.